Hello, everyone out there on the live stream. Thank you for joining us here on YouTube for this conversation. It's going to be super, super fun with Eugene. Hi, Eugene. Hey, Michael. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. You ready to kick off this podcast? Let's go. All right. Eugene, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I love getting down into the details of programming and writing code and you know working with APIs and building amazing things. But it's also really interesting to sort of step back and take a, a big picture view of the world um, of the software. And you wrote a really interesting article about applying some of the lessons you might learn from code back to your life. And I, I really enjoyed the idea of it. So I'm looking forward to talking to you about it on the show. Thank you. Happy to chat more about it as well. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be super fun. Now, before we get into the details of all that, you know, let's start with your story. How did you get into programming in Python? Um, hmm, well, I had a, my degrees in psychology. So uh, since then, I've been really interested in understanding, you know, how people behave, why they think the way they, be, they, they think, and how information changes their perceptions and behavior. Um, so, you know, to in order to do this, I, I used to run experiments and analyze the data in SPSS and, and, and Excel, but eventually, in work, it just the data just got bigger and bigger. So I moved on to R, and now I'm using Python. So that's how it happened. Uh, I mainly use Python because uh, I have problems to solve that require me to process data with Python. Yeah, really cool. You know, one of my very first programming jobs was at this incredibly cool place where it was. It started as a research lab, and then it spun out of the university to a startup, and the whole premise of what they did was to use eye tracking, not not some phone thing, oh. but like where you're looking to understand how people solve problems and how they think and so on. And it was mostly a bunch of PhD cognitive science folks, and they would work uh, in MATLAB and Excel and all yeah. that stuff. And I would help, yeah. help write software that would take that stuff and turn it into products and turn it into automation and, and whatnot. And it's, it's a really interesting world. And there's a lot a lot more opportunities for code and solving problems with code, especially on the data analysis side in psychology, than Fully agree. you might might first think, right? You think, oh, psychology, that's talking to people on the couch, like sometimes, <laughs> but not always, <laughs> not yep. a lot of the time. You're right. Uh, a lot of it is running experiments and like, like I'm, I'm sure they collected data about eye tracking oh, yeah. and you have to process the data. And that happens in real life as well. We run experiments, um, A-B testing, and we have to analyze the data. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. We would run tons of experiments. We would have, you know, maybe a week where 50 people came in, we'd have like one way mirrors and all sorts of recording equipment and like analyze that. They'd even, you know, put ads, I think in Craigslist, all sorts of places like, hey, we need somebody to come like surf on these websites for half an hour. We'll pay you 50 bucks. Can you come do that during lunch? Be like, yeah, I'll do that. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. But it was really neat to, to do the programming and stuff there. So yeah, I mean, Tell me a little bit more about that transition because it must have been a little bit challenging, right? There's not a lot in your like traditional education of psychology that teaches you programming. Maybe a little bit, but not a ton, right? No, actually, in my traditional education, uh, for psychology, we use um, SPSS and R. SPSS is this IBM product, yeah, um, proprietary. Um, so nothing about it. I, I did know a bit of about the statistics and you know how to work with data, but that's about it. Um, so I think back then, uh, when I first started getting my first job, I had to learn a lot of Python and SQL on my own. And you know that was the time when you know Coursera was available, and uh, Coursera is a lifesaver. Uh, if yeah. you ask me, I learned all my Python and, and and data science stuff from Coursera. So it was you know. After work, spending one or two hours doing the courses and uh, doing the lessons, the hands-on exercises were amazing. And, and today, nowadays, you have so much uh, available Python resources to yeah. help you quickly pick up, get something working, iterate on something, fix fix the bugs, and you know have something that you can play with. And it just makes it so fun to learn Python now. Yeah, yeah. it's there. There's so much to know in programming these days, but at the same time, it's there's so many resources out there to help you. Yeah. It's it's really a huge benefit. I remember when MOOCs, the, the, the <laughs> MOOCs came on, as they called them, like these these courses with many, many, many people in them. And it was such a revolution at the time. And it, and yes. now it's just one of the million options, you know? Yep, I agree. Uh, I think I think MOOCs are really the, 
the great equalizer. I mean, education is the great equalizer and, and MOOCs is by making it freely available across the internet with great educators can just teach anyone and not confine to a classroom. Uh, I think that was amazing. And that was what helped me transition from, you know, SPS and, SS, SPSS and R to Python and, and Spark and, and machine learning. Uh, yeah. had to, it opened that door for me. Yeah, yeah. Instead of studying uh, neurons, you're studying <laughs> neural networks now. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So how about now? What do you do day to day? Uh, you just made a big life change. Uh, I was reading that you recently moved from Singapore to Seattle. That's that's a big change, even though you know, not a whole lot in between those two things. If you draw a line, just a lot of water. But yeah, it's still yeah. A, a big change in terms of jobs and, and whatnot. Tell, tell us about that. So I think uh, towards the end of 2019, I think, or maybe in the middle of 2019, my, my wife and I were thinking of, you know, stepping off our comfort zone. Um, I don't know how many of your listeners have been to, to Singapore, but it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's a very yeah. comfortable, tiny island, uh, amazing weather. Um, but we thought, you know, we like to travel. So we thought, hey, you know, let's, let's try to live somewhere for a bit. So uh, we, I, we looked at a couple of places, like, well, a couple of tech hubs. Um, Seattle, San Francisco, Berlin, uh, Shanghai, and um, it so happens that uh, I got a get an offer from from Amazon. So nice. that's where yeah. I am now. Uh, I'm an applied scientist in Amazon, um, and uh, so what I do, I'm part of the Kindle team. So what I do in my day to day job is I try to help people read more, um, and we try to do this by helping them find books that they need to find. So what I do is I, I work on recommendation engines <clears throat> to, to try to pe help people, you know, as you're finding a book or based on what you have read to the extent that you have read it. We know this because uh, we have Kindle data. We know how much of a book you have completed. Uh, we can recommend you new books that you might be interested in. Or based on what you browse on the website, we can update our recommendations in real time and recommend you new books as well. So that's what I do in my day-to-day -day job. Yeah, well, that sounds really fun. You know, I actually really appreciate that from Amazon, specifically around the Kindle, to be honest, like a lot of stores are like, oh, you might also like that. I'm like, no, I don't also like that. I really don't <laughs> care. You know, there's just so many things uh, where I'm you know, shopping online or whatever, and it just doesn't make sense. But specifically for Kindle, I'll be reading a book and I say, you should also check out these other ones. Like a lot of times, like my next book is out of that list. I, I really love it. So oh. you, know, you can't go browse a bookstore these days. Um, I mean, we have a fantastic bookstore called Pals. It's like one of the largest bookstores around here in Portland, but you can't even go to it anymore. So yeah, that's pretty cool. So thanks, yeah. thanks for that good list there. Yeah, you and your your folks. I'm I'm happy to hear that, and I, 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 yeah, this is a great place where what I'm doing is very aligned with what I do, which is trying to help people. Uh, very aligned with my values, which is trying to help people learn more uh, by reading more books. So that's great. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you talk a lot about writing and well, I guess not just talk. You also, you know, put your time and energy <laughs> where your words are. Right. You do a lot of writing. And, you know, the reason that I wanted to talk to you about uh, having you on the show, like I said, is one of these articles that you wrote. But there's a whole bunch of them uh, that you have. So, you know, there's a couple of people who are really successful in the, the tech field that I can think of who really make writing an important part of what they're doing. Like I had uh, Jesse Giro Davis on the podcast at the time he's from MongoDB. I think he still is. Anyway, he, he talked about like all these design patterns of technical writing, right? Like here's the how to, here's the yeah. first difference and like all these really interesting things. And you know, I kind of get that vibe from you as well that like you've got these really strong ideas about writing and how it reinforces your programming side of the world you know what's your thoughts on that well um i like it i, I guess uh, maybe just to share a bit of backstory like why i started writing uh, yeah, so yeah. much i think um a couple of years ago um, i was interviewing a couple of mentors informal mentors right they didn't know i was getting them to be a mentor but i would just reach out to people who were two to three steps uh, ahead of me you know heads of data science ctos lead data scientists i'll ask them you know uh, the, the, the same, I would ask them the same question. What makes an effective data scientist? Um, and I would say, you know, is it uh, understanding the business domain deeply or is it, is it PhD research level skills, ninja hacking skills, Python or C++ yeah. or Java? And, and a lot of them uh, said, actually, you know, all that is really important, but there's one thing that you're missing out. And this one thing is transferable across all your, your entire career. And that one thing they said is communication. Um, at that point in time, 
I didn't believe it. I was immature. I didn't. I didn't think it was. <clears throat> I, I I didn't think it makes sense. But I thought, you know, so many of these people tried it. I I owe it to them to. Yeah. So many of these people mentioned. I owe it to them to try it and update my progress. So for one year, I said I'm just gonna volunteer for whatever writing opportunity, whatever speaking opportunity the company has. So I started uh writing about my side projects. I started writing an internal company newsletter, uh to to share about. What our team, our data science team, was doing, and I started speaking at conferences and meetups, um, and so that's why I've been started. Start, uh, that's why I started writing, and since then, uh, I found that writing actually helps me learn a lot, because I would write about something and I realize, hey, you know, I don't know anything about this thing I'm writing about. So yeah, I'm, I'm exactly, forced to learn. exactly. <laughs> you, you yeah, know, right? the, you you think you know you've learned enough to sort of have some thoughts, or you know, in the programming space, you can maybe get something to work, right? But if you've got to explain it, all of a sudden, it's not enough to know, well, there's two ways and I, I can just use that way. You, you've got to know, well, here's the two ways. What are the trade-offs? What, when should I use which? Like, you've got to dive into these sorts of details um, when you're either writing or speaking or presenting about it. And like, it just forces you another level down in your, your understanding and depth, right? Exactly. Writing is really difficult. And um, truth be told, I, I think a lot of people say, you know, you must really love writing. No, actually... I don't really love writing, uh, which is a bit weird. <laughs> I love learning and I love sharing about what I've learned online. And writing is my vehicle to let me do that. Um, yeah. So that's why I started writing. So why do I talk a lot about writing at work um, or, or writing in general? Is There's this question that I ask myself a lot. I, I used to ask myself this question and now a lot of people ask me this question. Hey, you know, as a data scientist, is your job to write code? Or is your job to write write documents? And I used to think my job was to write code, to build systems, to help customers. But yeah. then as, I, as, as I'm doing this more, I find that, hey, you know, a lot of times before writing code, I need to spend a lot of time thinking, researching, and designing. And the medium of that work is writing documents. That's why I encourage a lot of people, you know. Um, by, and I, so it's just like what you said. Hey, you know, do I serve my recommendations via Redis Cache or via Lambda or API Gateway or whatever? And I'm thinking through all these designs and I need to make trade-offs. And writing in a document, the pros and cons and the rationale for the decision forces me to do that so that when we start implementing things, we don't do things the wrong way, which is really expensive, right? Implementation is expensive. Um, right. So that's what, and I find that it has really helped me a lot. I don't feel that um, enough people talk about it and I want to encourage uh, people to write a lot as well. Well, yeah, I agree. And it seems to me like one of the fundamental jobs of a data scientist, at least one branch of data science is to take the raw information, think about it, and then communicate what it means, right? And that seems to go really hand in hand with what you're saying. Exactly. I think. Um, so there was once, uh, so, you know, so I was doing this one year of writing and, and, and uh, speaking practice right at work. And then um, in the past, I had people come up to me and say that, you know, Eugene, I, every time I have a meeting with the data scientists on your team uh, for half an hour, and then I walk away not knowing anything. I, I don't know what they spoke about. <laughs> and that's because uh, I think by, by and large, most people, you know, we tend to use jargon like AUC, ROC, distributed, all that. And, yeah. and we assume that business people will know it. Um, but I, I, I made this mistake as well. And then uh, one day I had a great boss who, who brought me aside. You know, Eugene, the way you're communicating, no one understands you. And I asked, what do you mean? And he, he gave me very good feedback. Uh, yeah. He was a great boss. And I started changing how I communicated things. And that made me a lot more effective at work. So yeah. that's why that's how I get started on that. Oh, fantastic. Well, I really like what you've done with the writing and stuff. And so, you know, maybe let's spend some time diving into the one that I think is probably the centerpiece of what we'll talk about. <laughs> we'll touch on a few other ones because you do a really good job in your writing of not just putting down your thoughts, but bringing other people's ideas and influences in there. So you have a lot of quotes, you have a lot of references to other things and so on. So yeah, I, I really like the way the style. So let's talk Thank about, you. you know, your article, what machine learning can teach us about life, seven lessons. <laughs> what, what was the, I, why, why did you write this? Uh, well, you know, as because when I was writing some of my previous articles, 
I like to, okay, this is an odd thing. Uh, I know that my audience are machine learning practitioners. And, you know, sometimes I write about things that, sometimes I want to write about things that I know will not interest them. So this is one of those. I want, I, I want, I like to write about life lessons, right? And I know it will not interest them, but I think it's really important. I want to write about that anyway. So, you know, in order to sneak it in, um, in this case, machine learning is really just a Trojan horse. Uh, machine yeah. learning is a Trojan horse where I sneak in these life lessons that I found really helpful for me. And I just, uh, you know, upon some reflection, I just want to write about it. And, and that's it. That's, yeah. that's how this article came about. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I love these Trojan horse ideas. Like, oh, I'm going to teach you <laughs> do something fun. I'll actually have a lesson, right? Um, yeah. And now go. the secret's out. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I haven't actually shared anyone share with anyone yet. <laughs> now they're going to know. That's right. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go through the seven lessons. The first one here uh, is data cleaning. Assess what you consume. And I'm, I'm a big fan of this idea uh, as a life lesson as well. So what's the story? Wait, before you get into that, like every one of these lessons, you start by saying, okay, here's the machine learning meaning, and then here's the uh, sort of follow-on lesson, right? So what's the machine learning lesson of data cleaning? I think the machine learning lesson of data cleaning is uh, most machine learning practitioners would know um, when you use noisy data, your machine learning model is going to be noisy and it's just not going to work. I think that's this cliche, garbage in, garbage out. In machine learning world, that yeah. is absolutely true. Um, and cleaning the data itself is actually most of the work in terms of training your model, cleaning the data, refining it, making it, uh, making the model be able to learn from it. So that's really important in the machine learning world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, you have a really interesting quote in here and um, you also have some really fun pictures, which we can talk about. Where is it in here? It was, um, yeah, as Randy Al shares, Data cleaning isn't the grunt work. It is the work, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think so many of these things uh, in a lot of these machine learning and like scientific programming sides, you have these amazing libraries, right? Like you can, uh, you know, pip install TensorFlow or whatever, and then you just feed feed the data, you know, got your data frame, you feed it over, boom, and like magic <laughs> happens. But it's, <laughs> right, you've got to get that data. You've got to like format the data. You've got to convert the data. Like that's, you got to understand that it's all correct, right? There's cool libraries like expectations that are like sort of unit tests for your data to make sure you don't feed in bad data and all that. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that statement a lot. That's pretty neat. Thank you. And uh, I linked to Randy Yao's post, which is a very good post. I, I think he wrote that, um, of course, I might be putting words into his mouth, but I think he wrote that because um, a lot of people think that data, data preparation is not sexy, data cleaning is just grunt work, but um, and he's trying to get people to remind people, no, actually it is the work. It is what actually makes a big difference in your analysis outcomes, in your machine learning outcomes. And I fully agree. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So life, life lesson from this one, what, what's the parallel life lesson you were trying to draw? Uh, well, the main life lesson that I was trying to draw is actually the one below that image. So, so you have a really I, I, fantastic image and you, you talk a little bit about food first before you get into what I think is more important, although food is you know, not unimportant. But we've all seen these horrible pictures of in like the 50s and 60s of doctors recommending cigarettes. Like my doctor recommends Camel, not Marlboro. You're like, oh my God, what is this? But there's like this really similar one for sugar of like all these like, you know, here's like, how do you, you don't get overweight, you eat your sugar, so you don't eat fatty food. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so yeah, the, that's one is food, which is really interesting, but then more importantly is news, right? So information. So, so if, you, if you could just scroll up to the image, uh, just, so in this image, right, we see that food is important and you know, bad food um, uh, actually makes you bad, uh, makes you unhealthy. But in this image, this image is both bad food and bad information. There's so much bad information out there on, on Twitter, mm -hmm. on Facebook, or social media, and you really have to be careful about what you consume, right? Misinformation, I mean, uh, uh, it is really easy to consume. You know, this this small 200 character tweets, or you know, uh, small mm -hmm. uh, empty calorie. I, I like to call them empty calories. Uh, yeah. in, on social media, you know, there's em empty calorie info bites, you call them. That's great. Yeah, there's, you know, <laughs> uh, some influencers who, who post really short things and, you know, they just go viral. Um, and 
But uh, uh, if you consume a lot of that, it actually, you think about, hey, did that actually change my life? No, it's actually kind of empty calories. And, and a lot of yeah. good writers, David Perel writes about this. It's like, you want your content to be very niche, very deep, very uh, high in nutrition. Uh, so I think yeah. uh, that's the same thing. When, when you consume light content, you don't actually uh, gain a lot. It, it's, can, it can be actually downright toxic. It's, a lot of times this light content is just one statement, you know, trying to sway, uh, sway, sway information, sway the public. So yeah. Yeah, I think for your, well, for your own sake, curate what you consume. I, I agree. I mean, it's so important and has so many knock-on effects, right? And it also has some interesting machine learning tie-ins, I, I would say here, and some recommendation <laughs> yes, engine, engine tie-ins. Yeah. I think maybe it's, I'm not 100% sure about the, the attribution, but I think Tony Robbins said, you've got to be the guardian of your own mind, right? You've yeah. got to consciously decide what you let in, what thoughts you let influence you, and what ones you just you know eject and say, this doesn't matter. Definitely. Because yeah, uh, what you think can really affect you. But I was thinking even more like if I go onto YouTube and I start to consume something that's eh, a little kind of crummy, but whatever. The very next thing is, you know, you're never intense enough for YouTube. If you watch three videos on one topic, like it's like you need a hundred more of these videos, right? It's, yeah. It's just like so with a lot of social media, and I don't use Facebook enough, but I can imagine it's similar. Like as you start to trend even a little bit in one way or the other, it just throws you a huge rope and tries to pull you hard, you know, for the sake of engagement down that path. And so small curves these days seem to matter a lot more. Like if you used to like grab, I don't know, some crummy newspaper, like, um, like rumor newspaper at the grocery store and read it. Then you went back and you read the New York times when you got home, it, the New York times wouldn't just stop showing you the important news. It would, and show you all sorts of junk because you read the, but nowadays that's what happens. It's crazy. It is. Um, and I think a lot of it is because of just how machine learning works. If you click on something and you read something, it thinks that you like that thing and it recommends you more of that thing. Yeah. Uh, which sometimes it's just a, you, you, you misclick or something and sometimes it's a mistake. And that's why uh, machine learning and social media can sort of polarize people, yeah. which is not what yeah. we want to do. Uh, so it really takes, you need to be yeah. conscious about how, how you're affected by it. Right. Obviously, your article is not about this, but we're going to have to reckon with this as a society. Definitely. Period. Yes. In, in a big way. But uh, let's go on to lesson number two, low versus high signal data and seeking to con disconfirm an update. Uh, tell us about this one. Um, so maybe I'll start with the machine learning aspect for it. I, I think um, so what I'm trying, what this here is a support vector machine. So, you know, you're trying to separate the blue dots from the red dots. And, you know, uh, on the left yeah, so most let, image... Yeah, let me do, yeah, go ahead and just describe it real quick because most people are just listening. Yeah, I mean, on the left most image, I mean, uh, it's very easy to separate, right? So you can see the margin is very wide. The margin is the the, the dash line, the, the distance from the dash line to the uh, solid line. But then on the middle image, all of a sudden we introduce a new red dot and the margin becomes very narrow. So, you know, mm -hmm. your, your certainty is, is a lot less. And you start to think, hey, you know, maybe I'm less certain. And then on the right, and, and then you start to collect more, more information, more data points around that, around that. And then all of a sudden, your margin becomes a curved margin. So what you thought was true, and you were very certain about it on the left side of the image, now suddenly changes yeah, you, uh, to the you right. You get a little bit more information, and you're like, oh, this is not the dividing line or the distinction at all. It's totally more nuanced or whatever, yeah? <laughs> Exactly. So I, I know I shouldn't be referring to the image uh, because it's a podcast, but uh, I, I think the image is really powerful in terms of how machine learning in machine learning, you uh, change your decision boundaries. Um, and in real life, this is the same. So I think Jeff Bezos has a very powerful uh, quote that, that says, I think something like this that says that I, I actually didn't put it here, um, but I, I'm just reminded of it that says that, hey, you know, when data this uh, disagrees with anecdotes, he tends to prefer the anecdotes because a lot of times it sort of means that maybe you're measuring things wrongly. Mm. So data is very easy to collect. We have a lot of data, but whereas anecdotes is one or, one or two of those uh, feedback points yeah. that you know, disagrees and we sort of need to you know, ju jump in the anecdote, collect more data around it. So I, I think this is the same thing. Uh, and you know, when you're asking for feedback, uh, often people give you good feedback, you know, you're doing great, continue what you're doing, you're doing fantastic. Yeah. And when people give you bad feedback, dig into it, right? That is a gift for you to improve, dig into it, ask them, hey, you know, 
I love what you just said. Can you give me more detail? And so it's, it's giving you uh, more detail, more information on how you should be thinking, how you should be designing, how, how your code should change in your code reviews. Um, um, and it yeah. helps you grow. Yeah. I think in, especially in the US, people are very uncomfortable with negative feedback, <laughs> both giving yeah. and receiving it. Uh, but yeah, it, it, if it's given in the right way, it can be very valuable. I mean, maybe listening to like what people put on your YouTube video, that might not be all that constructive. There's a lot of weird just people with issues at yep. scale. But yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, some some more closed space, right? Like a code review or something, right? That's a, definitely an opportunity to learn something. Even if even if the person is wrong, it's still an opportunity to you know learn their perspective uh, yep, and definitely. learn from it, right? So one of the quotes you have in this section is, uh, by Karl Popper, true ignorance is not the absence of knowledge, but the refusal to acquire it. And I think that also goes hand in hand with the polarization and stuff you talked about before. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that um, I adopt the growth mindset. I, I think that people can change, can grow. And, and that's what that's what's necessary, right? In our industry, right? Tech, uh, things change so fast. Yeah. So we have to keep... Uh, Try, try to keep up with the times in terms of the technology. I think fundamentally we should focus on the problems, but you know, don't, don't ne neglect uh, how technology is changing as well. For sure. All right, number three, explore, exploit. Balance for the greater long-term reward. So it has to do uh, with reinforcement learning, right? Yeah, so in reinforcement learning, uh, well, you we can imagine that you know, at a start, you don't know anything about uh, the state of the world, right? Uh, let's, let's say um, you have two, this is an example for me. Let's say you have uh, a restaurant that you love. Uh, and let's say you, you, you first land in Seattle. When I first landed in Seattle, I didn't know where to eat. I didn't know what was good. And I would explore many different restaurants, many different takeouts. And after exploring, um, you know, after maybe I explored 10 of them, I, I found that, hey, you know, this place is great. It's cheap. It's nearby. The food is so yeah. solid. Um, and I would just exploit it all the time. <laughs> exactly. I, like uh, in my neighborhood, you know, there's maybe two or three Thai food restaurants that I always go to. And if somebody <laughs> says, Hey, let's get some Thai food. I'm not going to go, well, there's another one we haven't tried yet. Let's go. To it's just like, Nope, that one's good. We're going here. You know what I mean? I am exactly like that. I'm such a lazy yeah. thinker. I, I, and I just like, this is really good. It fits my appetite. It fits my taste and it's cheap. Why, why, why do we have to try something new? But thankfully uh, my wife is an explorer. <laughs> so while I'm exploiting, uh, she she encourages me, you know, let's explore these new things. And sometimes uh, I find treasure gems that I would never have tried. But because she's encouraging me to explore, uh, I found it. So yeah. that's that's the balance. So at the start of your career or at the start when you're trying to solve a new problem, explore. Take some time to explore as much as you can. Um, but then once you find it, exploit. But, you know, as you're exploiting, don't forget to also be exploring a bit. Yeah. Yeah, so you tie this back to careers a lot about uh, basically, as you sort of touched on, continuous learning and, you know, don't get too comfortable and it just go with, don't, don't just fall all the way into the exploiting side. Like, I went to college, I got my engineering degree. Uh, why do I need to learn, you know, Jupiter? Uh, I'm just going to keep using MATLAB or, or Excel and we're just going to keep working on this building or bridge or whatever, right? Like, I think it's easy to do that. I, I spent the time and the money and worked hard and got, you know, good grades and a four-year degree. Like, why do I need, I'm done with tests and learning. I can just stop, right? Exactly. I was just going to say this exact same, uh, a very similar uh, example. I study SPSS and R in college. Why do I need to learn Python, Right. Well, you know, Python has a lot of benefits. It's a lot faster, truth be told. Um, and then, you know, now that I learned Python, I know SQL. Why do I need to learn Spark? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if yeah. you explore a bit, it can really help you make your work a lot more effective. Maybe I know decision trees and linear regressions. Do I really need neural networks? Um, but, you know, it's always taking some time to explore about, explore what might be new. Sometimes some of this exploration doesn't work out, and that's fine. Uh, at least you're, if, you, if you think of it from a learning perspective, you're learning a lot. Um, but you know, take the time to, to sample around every now and then. Yeah, absolutely. You have uh, a couple of great quotes in here from uh, two people. I find both of them very interesting. Naval, I just, uh, Silicon Valley guy that just goes by Naval in A V A L. Yep. And, uh, he has a really interesting, 
tweet storm that turned into a podcast series and some interesting thinking. Are you familiar with this? Oh uh, yes, I I I love that. No, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do that. too, actually. I, I, it made reading your articles and stuff remind me of that. But he says, your goal in life is to find out find uh, the people who need you the most, to find out the businesses that need you the most, to find the projects and the art that need you the most. There's something out there for you. And then Matthew McConaughey, McConaughey says, uh, talks about when he was... Going, he was in law school and decided to go into film school, which is obviously a big career switch. Uh, as somebody and he's like, No, no, I have to do this right. And he was afraid of what his dad would say. And instead of saying, You know, you've thrown away your, <laughs> your career or whatever, he just said, Don't half ass it. Like, if you're going to do this, you better go do it. Right. So that's sort of the, uh, you know, Naval's is the explore and McConaughey's, or maybe it's the exploit. Like, like, once you're in it, go in it full. Exactly. So I, I think um, th that being said, I mean, a, a lot of us, uh, maybe we are a couple of years in our careers, but I think what Navelle tries to remind us, you know, um, you might not be very happy what you're doing right now, or you might love what you're doing right now, but you know, there is, oh, there's, there's always something that uh, suits you specifically. So some people might love research and they might not fit into a startup environment. Or some people, uh, in in a, for example, maybe a, a big innovation lab, they need some of their data scientists to really focus on research, and they might not fit in there if the data scientist is more about iterating fast um, mm. and you know shipping fast to customers. So there's always something better for you. So keep exploring, and once you found it, exploit it. Like uh, Matthew McConaughey, he didn't half ass it; he went all in, and, and yeah. he's doing it fantastic. It worked out okay for him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, transfer learning books and papers are cheat codes. Yeah. So I, um, in, in machine learning, uh, I think a couple of years ago, there was this thing called uh, transfer learning, which um, it didn't make quite a storm, but I thought it was really breakthrough. So what it, what it means is that um, there's, there's this competition called ImageNet where you try to classify uh, images into thousands of categories, right? I think 1,000 categories. And those big companies like Google, Microsoft, they would train huge models to classify this. And this would be deep neural networks. And what, we, what people found is that you can take what they have trained, this huge model with all the weights and parameters, and you can just chop off the last layer and put your own model. Maybe you're trying to classify cat versus dog. You can use that model and then classify cat versus dog and put in your own data and just update the model and it would work fantastically well um, and orders of magnitude uh, better than wow. if you had to yeah. train from scratch. I think that's a cheat code. I use that when I first heard about it, I used that cheat code. Uh, okay, since I've heard about it, I've only used transfer learning for work as much as I can. Yeah, so the, the model, idea is you, instead of starting with a completely blank set of weights in your model and just feeding data and going, no, that's right, that's not right, that's a dog, that's not a cat. No, that's, that's right. Yes, that one is a cat, good job. You. You can use kind of a vague one to automate some of that driving. Is that kind of the idea? Like you, you give it a little bit of knowledge, but not too much, and then you keep still teaching it. Is it is that this this model is able to distinguish thousands, uh, a thousand different cats and dogs and hamburgers and and cars? Yeah, and you're just taking all that knowledge that's in there, and you're just fine tuning it for, uh, for your specific use case of cat versus dog, and yeah. it really cuts out so much effort. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very cool. So in this one, the, the life lesson here is think, you know, we were touching on this before that people feel like a lot of times they've gone, they've got their degree, they've studied, they've worked hard. Like they just want to have fun and live their life and not just keep going. But like the way to think of, you know, education, you know, formalized education, let's say, you know, even I would say college is this generalized pre-training, right? You're not ready to really go do the thing. You haven't really learned the thing but you're you're much closer than somebody who hasn't right something like that schools I, I generalized agree. pre training yes I, I fully agree i think a lot of people um think that uh, at, at least what i've seen some people see that you know after they graduated you know i'm done i'm done learning um but uh i don't know about you but after i graduated after i got into working well i realized hey i didn't learn any of this stuff yeah uh, in the none. working world. I, I had to learn <laughs> a lot that. more Almost none. I think the only thing that I learned at school that helped was Excel and R and SPSS, the yeah. technical skills. So 
so school sort of trains you, you know teamwork uh, how, how to work in a project team communication um you know how to learn fast because you know every semester you'll be taking four subjects it teaches you the general stuff and then once you get to work there's a lot of online uh there's a lot of on the job training that you have to do yourself so the point that i was trying to make here is that school is really just the start of it it's generalized pre training you could stop there um but if you fine tune, if you take the effort to fine tune your model from school onto your very specific task, you would be orders of magnitude more effective. Um, that, that's what I'm. Yeah. That's the message I'm trying to give. And yeah. I also want to tell people, and, and this is the next paragraph, is that um, we have transfer learning models, right? And in real life, that's the same thing for transfer learning models, which is books, yeah, and academic papers. I want to try to get people to read more books. Um, I've gained a lot from books. Uh, I've gained a lot from academic papers. And you can imagine, I don't know, maybe you read a book by, I don't know, Sapiens uh, by Noah yeah. Ra- Harari yeah, or book. Deep Work by Cal Newport, um, I'm, mm-hmm. who I'm a big fan of. They have thought about this, or, or Navelle's, Navelle's thread, right? They've, they have thought about this for so long, five years, decades, and they've compressed it in a book that you can read in eight to 10 hours. Read it. Um, and you'll be that much smarter and, and you see through life, see life in a different way and, and you'll gain a lot. Yeah. That's super interesting. I, I do agree with it that you don't necessarily have to agree with everything they say. It doesn't yeah. have to match your situation, but it does give you a whole lot more experience without going through the hardship of what, getting that experience. Exactly. Uh, and, and yeah. I think it's magic. That's yeah, what separates uh, human beings <laughs> from animals, right? Where we can transfer knowledge. Uh, we can yeah. perform telepathy. I can transfer knowledge to you, to anyone on the internet by writing. Um, and people do that through books in the past. Yeah, very so interesting. That's, that's magic. So you say uh, books are the weights and biases of the great thinkers who've come before us. That's pretty awesome. So on this, I wanted to ask you about uh, what you thought about, I don't know, quote, new media, right? Like I'm thinking... In, particular youtube but other places right like these books are very like the tradition of meaningful books are very important <laughs> and long and everybody knows about them right but play you talked about the MOOCs before i mean youtube i was talking about the negative aspects of it before but there it's amazing what you can learn if you go over to places like YouTube with the desire to seek out this kind of information. Like there's so much good stuff there mixed in with like cat videos, <laughs> right? Yeah. What, what do you think? I think that um, hmm. I am ambivalent to it. Uh, I think I have, a pre- I have a preferred way of learning, which is to read mm. books. Uh, nonetheless, I know that um, video is awesome in the sense that I can write some code, I can iterate, and you can see me doing it. it it's almost impossible yeah. to, to convey that in a book, or maybe some, some code examples. So that's really amazing. I think um, both new media um, has strengths, and it also has... Uh, and the difference between new media and traditional media is that new media is just a lot more powerful. Um, a lot more powerful, it can be powerful for good and also powerful for not so good. A lot more powerful in the sense that, you know, MOOCs are amazing, right? A professor can teleport into your into your house and teach you. That's mm-hmm. powerful. But powerful for not so good in the sense that you know, we have things like that reduce your attention span, TikTok videos or, or uh, short snippets of articles that yeah. um, it's also very powerful. Um, it's just whether it's uh, for, for good or, or not so good. So... That's something to think about when you're using uh, new media to learn. It is. Yeah, it's it's definitely more risky in that you can get distracted and pulled away because all those places yeah. are about that for sure. But, you know, like I was recently watching a video of an opera singer and like vocal coach analyzing like this um, heavy metal singer and like dissecting the song from a perspective of like an opera singer. And I'm like, I, I appreciate both of those art forms way more having seen like that experience right? and I would never have that experience exactly and, and I exactly. would never go down to the bookstore and pick, go pick up a book on like <sighs> like you know sing you know singing theory and stuff I just wouldn't right I would find something else that to spend my time on but anyway like th- those are the kinds of things I'm thinking that are you just you wouldn't expect but you can find interesting things there right definitely definitely 
Hey, I want to go back uh, uh, really to this one really super quick because I skipped over it right at the end. But you talk about um, this um, exploring versus exploit exploration versus exploitation thing and saying, look, you don't always have to worry so much about this stuff because sometimes many things are uh, what you call two-way doors. And there's this interview over here um, of Jeff, Jeff Bezos. And it, he has this distinction of some decisions being two-way doors and some of them being one-way doors. And you shouldn't put about the same concern, worry, energy, and, and whatnot into both types of decisions. They're not equal, so don't treat them equal. Can you speak to that real quick? I thought that was super interesting. Yeah, um, I think that I, I, I'm just gonna use uh, Jeff's example. For example, um, uh, maybe you start a start, maybe you're doing a side hustle and someone wants to acquire it or someone uh, wants to, to complete purchase it from you. That's a one way door that, you know, after you sold it, there's, there's no way to reverse it, right? Uh, yeah. or, so, however, you know, that the, maybe you do, you start a side hustle and then maybe you're thinking, hey, should I be targeting? Python programmers or R programmers or I don't know Scala programmers, that's a two way door. You you can all easily pivot. So I think what Jeff is saying is that the one way door, uh, they're, they're very difficult to reverse, but it's a lot less. It happens a lot less, and a lot of yeah. us, a lot of people, treat two way door decisions as one way door decisions. And I think he's saying that, hey, you know, um, it, it's good to distinguish between both and devote the amount of energy and due diligence and analysis into each of this. Um, yeah. And, and that, that makes it, that makes it help more, help, help you make more effective decisions more efficiently. Yeah, I totally agree. I thought this was, like I said, I thought this was insightful and I feel like in programming and in code, a lot of people get stuck in the so-called analysis paralysis. They're just stuck like trying to decide like every decision is like, it's it's overwhelming and it's hard to decide what to do because you feel like you might make the wrong decision. You don't have enough experience. Like so much of those things, you can just oh, we'll just refactor this later, or we can just throw away this later. Like oh, we're, I'm going to use a relational database. Oh, we should have used a NoSQL database. So we'll just throw it away and switch it over. It's like probably not that big of a deal. Versus exactly, we're going to let all the Python guys go and hire a bunch of Java guys <laughs> and rewrite the whole thing. Like if you're a year into that decision, you're you're fairly committed, right? Like so, there's really I think understanding like, oh, that's a two-way door decision allows you to just like try it and, and experiment. Fully agree. And, and that's what, uh, that that's hopefully by understanding the, the difference between one-way door and two-way doors, it makes it easier to explore, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. I, I agree. I think that's worth calling out. All right, iterations. Uh, find reps you can tolerate and iterate fast. Um, so I think, uh, Machine learning, a lot of machine learning involves iteration. Clearly, uh, uh, neural networks are iterations. Every time you pass the data through multiple epochs and the data learns, and with each iteration, with each epoch, the machine, uh, the machine learning model error reduces. Your machine learning gets, uh, model provides better predictions and gets more accurate with your metrics. That is the same with life. I think uh, a lot of people um, expect, you know, uh, this is what I used to expect. I expected that I would read something once and I would fully understand it. All of the knowledge is in my brain. And yeah. then, you know, I realized that that is never, that, that is never true. So, um, and actually that actually lowers my expectation of myself. You know, sometimes I'll read a paper and then, you know, I'll try to discuss it and I realize I, I don't actually know the details. That lowers expectation of myself. You know, I, I tell myself, you know, Eugene, by reading it once, you're never going to get it. Uh, don't, yeah. don't fully expect yourself to that. It's, it's too high a bar. So maybe read it a few times, uh, be, be, be kinder to yourself. So that's the same thing. Um, when I read papers, I, I go through it multiple times. Uh, when I do A-B tests, uh, I, I fail two times, so at one time I succeed. So I feel like 50 to 75% of the time. And, and you just got to learn to be uh, uh, kinder with yourself, with yourself where you iterate, right? I, th I think I've posted some examples here. Um, the Angry Birds developers failed 51 times. Uh, Sir James Dyson failed 5,000 times in 15 years before a vacuum cleaner worked, right? And, you know, yeah, imagine yeah. if he gave up, we would never have that. Uh, but again, a lot of great examples here about people who just iterated and, and just stuck to it. I think it also sort of ties into the previous one, right? Um, the the two-way doors, you know, 
it's okay if it doesn't work on a lot of these types of things. Just keep going. Just try again, right? Eventually, exactly. you'll you'll find one that fits. Yeah. Yep. There's there's Speaking plenty of those. Yeah. Speaking of fitting, overfitting. Focus on intuition and keep learning. Keep learning. So I think uh, overfitting is uh, well. I guess it's overfitting is when your machine learning model memorizes the training set too much um, and, you know, uh, and can't predict well on the whole, on the prediction set. Right. It's I almost think, perfect on the training set. Like it knows that it's cold, but it's so specific that any slight variation, even though it should be, you know, it should be a dog, it's, it doesn't know it's a dog. Exactly. Um, an example of this is, you know, when your machine learning model learns on customer IDs and, you know, when new customer IDs come in, it, 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 it just crap. So I, yeah. I think the, the clearest, the, the, the person who really pushes for this is Richard Feynman. He says that um, there's, there's no, and, and, and the way he teaches math and physics is, is the same. He, he goes directly into intuition, forget about formulas or forget about memorizing stuff. If you understand the intuition, you will understand it better and you can generalize a, across many, many things. I think in life, it also makes the same sense. Uh, don't, don't try to memorize things or, or don't try to memorize knowledge, right? I think if you have, have, the, have the intuition um, of the fundamentals, uh, it, you, you'll find that it, it, it transfers across uh, many, 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 uh, many, many different uh, domains. For example, I think Elon Musk talks about knowledge as a tree. So, mm -hmm. you know, the fundamentals of the tree are the trunk. That thick trunk is the fundamentals that supports all the branches you want to make sure that the intuition is like the trunk. You, are, you want to make sure that your trunk is solid and then you can build on new branches or cut off new branches and, and grow new branches as, as necessary. So I think the way to grow this intuition, uh, at least for me, I find that, you know, uh, being a beginner is, is absolute, uh, is, is the best way to do this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, very interesting. Our last one uh, has to do with ensembles and ensembling diversity of strength. What is yeah, ensembling? Uh, I guess ensembling um, is that, you know, uh, I could train a model, maybe a linear regression, and another model, maybe a decision tree, and a new and another model, maybe a k-nearest neighbors. And they would all have their different errors. They would all have their different bias biases and strengths. Uh, but the unusual thing in machine learning is that, you know, you can just take all their predictions and average them, and they would do better than, than all of them combined. And actually, that's a... That's a cheat code that everyone is doing on, on Kaggle competition. You know, just train thousands of models and just combine all of them. Interesting. Uh, you know, I, it reminds me of like a much simpler example. There's sort of the wisdom of crowds. Like uh, you hear uh, stories of people saying like, here's a jar, a big jar, glass jar full of jelly beans. And you got to guess how many jelly beans there are. Like many, if any given person will over underestimate a whole lot. But if you ask a hundred people, it's usually really close to the actual number or, you know, there's some weird examples of this at like state fairs, there'll be like a cow and people will have to ask like, how much does the cow weigh? <laughs> you know, it's like a competition and people get it really wrong, but it's usually really close if enough people answer and participate and it's average, right? Exactly. Um, so having diversity, diversity of opinions, diversity of thoughts, I think is very powerful. Uh, so that's, yeah. that's what I'm trying to encourage here as well. Yeah. So what's Where the I... story uh, about life here? Instead of like guessing the way to cows, which is not all that <laughs> practical. Well, I, I think that uh, one way, okay, maybe a quick one, which is one way to do when you are trying to build teams is um, you might want to deliberately try to find people uh, which are different from you, which uh, right. which are different, which complement your strengths. Um, I, I know, uh, you know, sometimes uh, in tech interviews, we want to find people that are similar to us, have the same skill sets that, you know, fit this mold, fit this job description. Uh, that's useful, it's effective. I, 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 but I personally have, have built teams whereby it's very diverse, uh, maybe from different countries or one third female. And I found that the, the creativity that comes from this is really powerful. And the other one, which is, I think, of course, Scott Adams is, the, is, uh, is known for this. He says that, you know, if, if you can't be the top of your field, combine multiple superpowers like Scott Adams did, he combined mm -hmm. his ability to draw, his sense of humor, and his business know-how, and he created Dilbert, which is uh, no one else can replicate Dilbert. It needs someone yeah. like Scott Adams mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah, you know, that general idea, I actually hit on this a lot because there are a lot of people who listen to this show who are not traditional computer science developers or traditional data science folks. 
And I think sometimes they feel like it's they don't have quite the same skill set to compete with those people. And how are they going to compete with somebody with a, you know, a master's degree from Stanford in computer science? And, uh, you know, what I, my thought on all this is you look, if you're really good at economics and you're pretty good at programming, there's not too many people who have both of those skills, right? Like all of a sudden you go from competing with a hundred thousand down to like 500 <laughs> or something. I don't know. Not that maybe it's a little bit extreme, but you know, like the, that if you need that intersection of skills, all of a sudden it becomes super, super powerful. And what you're suggesting here is maybe like building teams. You can kind of build that in the team rather than in an individual. Exactly. And I, I want to go back to your previous example, um, you know, someone uh, who's maybe a decent programmer, but you know, can't compete with, with someone who graduated with a degree in, degree in CS and a master's in CS and PhD in CS, it goes back to Navelle's tweet, right? Um, there's something that is just right for you that can tap on your skills in economics and com, com science. You just need to find it and, and that would be a great fit. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, well, that was the the seven items and I, you know, I enjoyed thinking about them and just seeing how these, these machine learning examples maybe can be analogies for living life. It's, it's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So a, a couple of other things real quick that you've spoken about is you've written a, a couple of things on sort of productivity as a developer and in the tech field. One article called How to Accomplish More with Less Useful Tools and R Routines, and then also Routines and Tools to Optimize Your Day, uh, which is a, a guest post by Susan Chu. Yep. So um, yeah, those, those were really interesting, but in particular, during one of them, I don't remember which one, uh, you talk about this article by Paul Graham. And uh, Paul Graham uh, wrote this thing called Maker's Schedule versus Manager Schedule. And, you know, I think you talk a lot or we talk in the tech field a lot about getting into flow, you know, really programming and just having uninterrupted time. And yet, I think probably more than ever, people are being pulled in different directions because everyone is just a Zoom call away. It's not even if you're not in the office, you're now just as eligible to be sucked into a meeting as anyone else, right? Yep, definitely. Um, yes, yeah, so you can you talk real quickly about this because I think if, it's a short article, but I think having awareness of this idea of a maker's schedule and a manager's schedule and how they're not super compatible and they. You got to be careful to help them coexist. Yeah, uh, I think so, that's important. So I think that, uh, of course, all credit goes to Paul Graham for this. Um, so makers, you know, um, to even start to design something or to start to code a framework, you sort of need, I don't know about you, but it takes me like 30 minutes to warm up, to have, mm -hmm. to, pop, to, to load all the concepts into my memory so I can start yeah. juggling them in my head. I mean, you know, once I load all, all that into my head and then I can, okay, I can start writing pseudocode, you know, t tweaking things, testing things iteratively. And that takes time. And it takes me maybe about 45 minutes, 60 minutes to get into flow. And once I'm in the flow, I, I'm moving really quickly, like speeding things through or once I'm in the flow of, you know, fixing a bug. And I I don't know about you, but if I don't fix the bug, I, I can't stop. I can't go for lunch. Um, and that yeah. motivation, that drive, if someone pulls me into a meeting, um, it sort of kills the motivation sometimes for the day. And, you know, if you had continued for just 30 minutes, you would have fixed it. But if, if it's yeah. broken by, by something in the middle, it will be gone. So how I try to do this is that I actually deliberately block uh, my time for, uh, in the morning before lunch. I actually block it out with meetings, uh, my own meetings, so that I can actually use that time to get in the flow. It depends on when, when your energy level is highest. For me, it's actually in the morning. And then I actually have, uh, I say that when people want to ask for a meeting, I say, oh, sure, let's do it after 3 p.m. if you're okay with it. Uh, because yeah. after 3 p.m., I, I mostly can't do deep work anyway. So I think yeah. that's that's useful to be aware of. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and I, I agree with that. Uh, Paul talks about if you're on a manager's schedule, what you do is you go from meeting to meeting to meeting. And if you've got a, an hour gap in your day, you know, oh, you could just meet with somebody else. Maybe that's like a time to just, you know, set up a meeting so you can get to know somebody and dig in with that that person or the team or the project. And that's fine if you're on a manager's schedule. But if you're on the maker schedule, maybe you do need the whole morning uninterrupted so that you can get into that. You know, like, you know, you've had a good session when 
you know, you program and program and then you stop for a second and you're like, wow, I'm hungry. I really <laughs> have to go get stuff. It's like three in the afternoon. I forgot to eat lunch. Like that, that's totally possible that that happens. Right. But if, yeah. And I would just want to say that these sessions feel so fulfilling, feel so satisfying. You feel like you've gotten yeah. so much work done in such a compressed amount of time that, okay. And now you can, uh, sure. I, I can have office hours now. So those yeah. sessions are really fulfilling. Yeah, I, I don't know how this is going to work out, but after reading this and some of your your other writing, I decided on my calendar I'm just blocking like Tuesday and Friday, like all day, and I'm just going to call those wow. maker days. We'll see how that works out, and if wow. I can just like get a lot of stuff done. So um, other days I'll have more meetings. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. I'm looking it's, forward it's to a new idea. hearing your experience. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, love to hear your experience it, about that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Chris May, uh, hey, Chris, out in the live stream says, uh, personal productivity brings superpowers to the powers you got by learning Python. Uh, totally agree. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very, very cool. All right. Well, I think, you know, that's probably about all the stuff that we have uh, time to talk about. Although you know, maybe really quickly, you could touch on, you know, at the bottom of your homepage, you've got a bunch of resources. Um, maybe just highlight something you think that people would find valuable there. Uh, so yeah, I, I like to, uh, again, a lot of these are answering questions that people ask me. So people ask me, you know, what are your favorite papers are? What paper should I read? So that's the second one on the list, Applied ML, um, where, you know, I, I try to collect papers uh, on real world machine learning, you know, by, by companies that have implemented it, the lessons they learn. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, you know, wow, there's so, I, I'm starting to get into this field. There's so much to learn. And that's the third link there where I find machine learning surveys. Uh, where, you know, people summarize uh, what has happened in the past. And of course, you know, people yeah. ask me things like, you know, how do you set up your Python repo so that you have code reviews and all that automatically or linting? So I have things like, you know, the Python Collab template or, you know, how to test machine learning models. And of course, recently I wrote about, you know, how to uh, write machine learning design docs. Uh, design documents and of course i have that as well so you know i mean yeah some of these are git repos some of these are, are just uh, articles and of course there's yeah. a the email course which is a lot of people ask me you know what makes an effective data scientist this is the question i asked a lot of my mentors five years ago and i try to summarize the five lessons that i've learned in a short email course where i only send you one lesson a day and of course, there's a short exercise that I hope people will do. And that's why I send you one lesson a day. And that short exercise maybe takes an hour or each. And I hope that after this, it sort of opens your mind that, you know, being an effective data scientist is, is, is beyond uh, coding well, uh, is beyond PhD level research, is beyond math. Cool. Yeah, that looks really useful. And uh, you also have a paper mill dash ML flow. Uh, what do you think of paper mill? Um, I started, so I started using this because uh, I wanted to run rapid experimentations in Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks. And MLflow is something that, you know, helps you track your machine learning models. PaperMill allows you to parameterize, at, at least how I'm using it is I'm parameterizing my Jupyter notebooks. Uh, by combining both of them, I have a master Jupyter notebook that has all the different params and all the different countries and marketplaces. And I just run that huge Jupyter notebook and all the experiments are logged. Uh, so I love it. So I, I decided to make it a template that other people can use as well. Cool. Yeah, people can check out all those things. Uh, put them in the show notes also on your website. Yep. All right. Well, I think that's probably it for all the time we have. So let me ask you the final two questions before you get out of here. You've written about two options, so I don't know which one you're going to go with here. Uh, but if you're going to write some Python code outside of Jupyter, say, like what text editor do you use? I have an answer, and I'm curious about your answer as well. For me... I'm a diehard PyCharm fan. Um, I've tried using VS Code. It just doesn't feel as snappy as as IntelliSense um, as as you think. I've I've been tr I've been using VS Code for my JavaScript. But what's your take, Michael? Should I be yeah. using VS Code more? Look, I'm I'm a fan of people doing VS Code, and I, I know a lot of people love it. The style of PyCharm is exactly it. Just fits my brain. Like, I feel that it just so perfectly understands the project I'm working on that it's it's the right tool for me as well. That's me. That's me. Um and I you I do some Scala on the side and you know PyCharm has a has a Scala sister which is IntelliJ and that it's just me that I, I I'm I'm still a diehard PyCharm fan. Yeah, right on. And then notable PyPI projects or package that um you know something out there maybe not the most popular but you're like oh I found this thing and it was super helpful. <sighs> 
Well, off the top of my head, I cannot think of anything, honestly. <laughs> um, but one thing that I love, that I hope people will love, is PyTest. Yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah, PyTest is super PyTest. good. Use you know, let test. me. Yeah, let me throw out an example uh, for you. Um, yeah, I should be careful. Better yeah. put Python on that search that term. So, um, along with this PyTest idea, something that I came uh, across recently is great expectations, which is kind yep. of like automated testing for the data cleaning and data validation, both yep. um, when you're pulling it in the first time as well as like production. So uh, there, there's, a, there's a one to build on top of the PyTest story. Exactly. So uh, as of now, the, the things that are taught in my mind, PyTest, PyLint, MyPy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the things that make code manageable fantastic. and maintainable, I, I, I think about that a lot. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, that's that's it for all the stuff we've got covered. Eugene, thank you for being on the show. Final call to action. People are maybe they want to get into your writing or they want to start writing and thinking more, uh, sort of almost full, become you know, developer philosopher type. So what advice you got for them? Just stop writing. Uh, final advice, why I write? Okay, by writing, you put your stuff online and people find you. And and this is this is why this podcast even happened, right? Yeah. Michael found me through my writing and and we talk about and we find like-minded people. That that has happened to me. I find so many like-minded people talking to me about machine learning and you know systems and, and writing. And I've made so many new friends. Do that. Uh, and you'll make a yeah. lot of new friends online. Highly recommend it. Yeah, it's great advice. I, I find like stepping just even a tiny bit outside of your comfort zone starts to lead to other things. And maybe you're not doing writing, maybe you're speaking at a meetup. Uh, that's yeah. even more possible than it used to be because you don't have to travel anymore yep. right you can reach out to meetups that are not next to you and so on I, the, all those things make huge differences definitely highly recommend and if you write because of this podcast email me my emails on my website i would love to read what, what you wrote about oh fantastic all right eugene thank you for being on the show it's been really great to chat with you about all this stuff welcome it's my pleasure take care yeah yeah, yeah take care chris Thanks for dropping by. I'm glad you are uh, enjoying the show. And I know you cut it at the end, but we'll uh, uh, enjoy it. And thanks everyone for coming on the live stream. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time.